I'm just going to take a bite out of this nice juicy pear. Mm, juicy! <laughs> So, how many of you have ever heard somebody say uh, these two words before? Okay, two words. The two words are beefed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the two words are <laughs> inside joke if you're watching online later. But the two words are I'm fine. Anyone ever heard those? Oh I thought about doing this is fine, like the meme, but uh, I, I, that seemed too impersonal. I'm talking about I'm fine, okay? Uh, if you're uh, a gentleman in the room, I hope this doesn't come across like sexist or weird, but if you're ever married and your wife says I'm fine, <laughs> all the girls say. laughed, so it's, it's, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> all the girls laughed, and if your wife says I'm fine, after you went and spent a couple hundred bucks on a new guitar, <laughs> she's not. No, I, <laughs> I'm just using it as a hypothetical example, okay? <laughs> now I'm in trouble. Shoot. Those two words rarely mean what they mean on the surface. It's, it's, it's actually a way of implying that it's, it's not fine. Um, but we, we, we kind of live our life like that, right? Like when somebody asks you, hey, how are you doing? And you say, I'm good. <laughs> Sometimes you're not good, but you don't wanna put the amount of effort into the conversation to, to delve into why you're not good because you know that they don't wanna hear about it. They just want you to like, you know, have that little moment of, hey, what's up, right? 
I'm fine is an interesting thing. Uh, and that can be like the existential piece of how we view our life. And what I'm going to share with you today is that uh, apart from Christ, I'm not fine. Like if I have Christ, I believe that I can say, okay, like now I'm fine because I have Christ now. But if I don't have Christ, I can't in clear conscience say I'm fine. And this is why. Okay, let's start with uh, a little bit. We're doing a sermon series right now called Experts. Uh, everyone say that with me one time. Experts. <laughs> it's just a silly thing we do for the video. But um, we've talked about how Jesus knows what he's saying and he knows what he's doing. And tonight we're talking about how Jesus knows what he's fixing. Okay? So this whole idea of I'm not fine or I'm fine, Jesus knows what he's fixing, uh, when we are born into this world, it's like, it's almost like we're born physically alive, but like spiritually dead. Does that make sense? Okay. You tracking with me so far? It's like every single person who's ever been born has been born physically alive, like, and, and let's not, okay, let's not go into that. But like every person sitting here that is living right now is born into the world alive, but it says in the word that if we are apart from Christ, we are dead in our sin or dead in our trespasses. So we're starting off from this place of need, okay? Uh, if you're a human being like I am, and I believe every one of you are, uh, we are in incredible need of a savior, of Jesus. Uh, and this is why, because every person eventually dies, right? Every person eventually dies. And that's a problem because that seems like the least fine thing I can think of, right? Like if I was to say, oh yeah, I'm super fine, but, but I'm about to die, then I can't really be like, okay, I'm fine, right? It's this whole idea that We're spiritually dead apart from Christ. And that's what Jesus has come to fix. Uh, I want to talk about two things here, and then and then we're gonna we're gonna double tap on this this business of how Jesus is fixing this. Um, you've probably heard of sin before, right? So sin. Um, we talk about that a lot. Um, where does sin come from? Maybe a bit of a hypothetical question, right? Uh, because sin doesn't come from God, right? Sin is missing the mark. It's, it's being, being basically less than, right? Being totally off base, totally off course, totally out of line with what God would have. Um, so when Adam and, in, uh, Adam, and in, <laughs> Adam and Eve sin uh, in the garden, that's the first sin, the original sin, right? And so who, who taught them it, right? Did they learn it? Was it part of their world or was it taught? Do you remember? Anyone remember this? See, God's original design is that we would be completely whole, that we would not have sin, right? That we would not miss the mark, that we would not be off course. Uh, but there's something in the world called evil, okay? Uh, when we talk about evil, sometimes we, we, we kind of blend our concept of sin and evil together, and we go, well, it's the same thing. Uh, now, maybe double check me on this, but I, I've rarely heard... Uh, the idea that the enemy, like Satan, you know, the devil, like sins because he's evil, right? I hear him described as evil or the enemy or wicked or all of these things, but sin is something that's like innately human, right? Human beings. I hear it, you know, in pertinence to like human creatures like you and I, right? And so when you look at what's going on in the book of Genesis at the beginning, where the enemy tempts Eve to take the apple. He's already got evil intent, evil desire. There's already evil present prior to 
the first sin of man. It kind of goes like one, two, three, like that. So you see that sin is possible because evil exists, right? And it's like, you know, we can be just completely like beautiful looking on the outside, right? Like we can be like, everything looks fine. Like the, the fruit in the Garden of Eden looked appealing. It looked nice. It looked like something that Eve wanted, right? And then Adam saw it too, and he wanted it as well. Uh, but it's like that parable Jesus told, right? Like he's like, when he, when he called out the Pharisees, he said that they were whitewashed tombs, right? Like beautiful on the outside, like, you know, decorated all up, but on the inside full of death, right? It's <laughs> full of dead men's bones. And we see in the scriptures that death entered the world through sin. So you see where there's like evil that, is, that exists and the enemy tricks them, sin enters, and through sin you have death in the world. Are you still tracking with me? Okay. Are you still tracking? This is the progression by which we get to the problem that Jesus is fixing. Okay. Uh, the enemy already had evil intent. But the serpent fell first, right? See, you and I are what we would call like a responsible moral agent, like a responsible moral being, right? Uh, notice how in the book of Genesis, uh, when, when God says, okay, like the serpent is cursed, walk, you know, crawl on your belly, and, and, you know, all this stuff. And then he says, like, the ground is cursed because of what the humans have done, right? The ground doesn't get cursed. You know, the earth doesn't get cursed because of, because of what the enemy did. It's because humans are responsible for it, right? Like, they're the responsible moral agent for the world, but through this trickery, through this uh, evil intent that the enemy had where he causes humanity to sin and to go off course and to make that bad choice, we see that death enters in, right? We have a responsibility for what God has entrusted to us as human beings. Um, so where am I going with this? Well, when Jesus comes on the scene, right? When Jesus shows up, he's aware of all this. He, he keeps bringing up his, like, important mission, right? Like, he's not straying off course, He's not straying off course. He's going to the cross, right? Because he's going to deal with uh, a few of these things, right? See, we always like to focus it really, really heavy on just the sin piece that Jesus came to pay for on the cross. But Jesus went to the cross actually for a few of these to, to remedy all three of the things I brought up. Uh, he did it so that he could conquer death, right? for us, on our behalf. Uh, the cross is where he, uh, Christ has victory over death in the grave. Uh, it's also where he provides for us, uh, you know, forgiveness, right, of sin. It's also where he has complete triumph over evil, over the evil one. Uh, we read in 1 John 3, verse 8, uh, that God came to destroy evil and the works of the devil. The reasons that Jesus has done what he's done is because nobody else can do it. Uh, all three of these things that I've mentioned, uh, evil, sin, death, are all a part of reality. They're a part of life that we cannot overcome. They're things that we can't deal with as humans. We're incapable of dealing with them. Um, we could go into like all of why that is, but I think suffice to say, if we'd figured out a remedy for those three things by this point, we'd be using it. <laughs> we'd be imploring it. We would be uh, kind of like living our best life now, right? But the reality is only Christ is able to take care of those three things for us. And that's why it's so important that we accept him, right? And and, and then it applies to us, right? See, all of those things apply to us whether we accept Christ or not. Evil, sin, death, right? They all still hold sway over us when we are outside of Christ. 
But if we're in Christ, if we're actually in Christ, then uh, his victory and authority over those three things is uh, a part of our co-heirship, a part of the fact that we're connected to the vine and, and he's got complete authority over these things. Uh, it says in the word that uh, when, when Jesus defeated death on the cross, he took uh, death on the cross, he took the keys of, of, uh, of death in the grave, right? Complete, absolute, fixed. But is it applied, right? Is it applied to my life, to my being? Uh, I know we're going to end it here. Uh, I know a lot of us, this might seem like familiar territory. This might be stuff we've looked at before, we remember from Sunday school, or uh, kind of like a real, real condensed look at like a huge chunk of the whole, the whole Bible. But, but what about my neighbor, right? What about the people that are around me all the time? who are outside of Christ, right? Like, I... These are all uncomfortable topics, right? Evil is uncomfortable, sin is uncomfortable, death is uncomfortable. But we can't be scared to talk about uncomfortable things. We, we can't be scared to... to have those real conversations with our real friends about what we think about them. And this is the beauty of Jesus, guys, is that be, uh, Jesus knows. He's known about these things all along, and he has a perfect plan, a perfect plan to remedy them. And he's fixing, right? He's fixing what we broke, what the enemy broke, right? Everything that we experience is, is like a gift from God. I exist because it brings glory to God. He allows me to exist because it brings him glory. And he's aware. He's aware of our pains and our difficulty. He knows what needs to be fixed in us. And, and he's made a way. That's, that's the part that I think is so incredible. Uh, like, isn't this cool? Jesus didn't send somebody else to deal with it. He didn't go, okay, well, like, I'm just going to, like, super load like the best Christian ever and be like, okay, you go deal with it, right? You, 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 go, you go head up, uh, you know, defeating evil and sin and death and all this stuff. Like, you know, I'll be in there with you, but I'll help you out. But like Jesus dealt with it himself. God himself dealt with it. And the way that he had to deal with it was through difficulty and pain and suffering and the cross. And I just like, I look at it and I look at that story and I look at why Jesus had, to, like, why did it have to be the cross? We could go into it. We could go into it, but Jesus endured the cross, right? It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, right? There's nothing joyful about enduring the suffering, but it's because Jesus knew what it meant. He knew what he was fixing. He knew what it would mean for you and I when we would accept him. Because he's calling us to himself, Amen. Jesus knows what he's fixing, and he knows about you, and he cares. I'm just going to pray for us. Uh, as we're praying, uh, and even later on, if you're watching this on the internet, as you're praying, I want you to thank Jesus for fixing your problem. If you're a Christian, and you've come to faith in Jesus, I, I, want, I want you to thank him for actually fixing what was broken about the way that you exist, right? If you have Christ in you, you have everything you need. But I also want you to think about your neighbor who doesn't have Christ in them and ask Jesus to give you strength and boldness and conviction to share his love with them and to share about what he has done. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for what you've done. I thank you that you went to the cross for the joy set before you. You endured the cross on our behalf, Lord. Lord, you knew that there was only one way that these things could be dealt with, 
And Jesus, thank you that you didn't send someone else. Thank you that you took it upon yourself, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't come away from tonight or later, whenever we're watching this, Lord, that we wouldn't go away from this thinking, I'm fine. <laughs> we go away like, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. Lord, help us to be more loving. Help us to take on the burden to just share how good you are. Because, Lord, we know we can't do anything about these three things for our neighbor, but we can tell them about you who can. And I pray that you would get all the glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.